I'm very happy and uh, pleased to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Brian uh, Schisler. Uh, Brian is a recent graduate uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Jan Sok Kim's uh, Systems Neuroscience Laboratory at the University of Washington, Seattle. And Brian's training uh, during the last six years uh, focused on the design and execution of ethologically relevant uh, experiments and paradigms, exploring acute and longitudinal fear, anxiety, and uh, decision making process in rats and mice. And he will present uh, the outcomes of his work, and, and uh, we're looking forward to hear what is risky closed economy. So thank you, Brian, for coming and then the floor is yours now. Great, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I have my coffee, even though it's tea time. Uh, hope you all have something to drink. Um, but yes, thank you. And uh, hi, thanks for the introduction. So the title of my talk today will be Thinking Outside the Conditioning Box, Ethological Paradigms for Studying Fear, Anxiety, and Risky Decision-Making in Rodents. And specifically, I'll be talking about uh, one particular paradigm that I've uh, helped develop in the lab, uh, and that's the risky closed economy. Okay. Right, so to begin, I wanna uh, briefly discuss uh, traditional paradigms of fear, anxiety, and risky decision-making in rodents. Uh, so what they are, uh, what they're used to assess, and what they're, what are their limitations. And so I'll just focus on a few uh, major ones. So uh, since the early days of Watson and Rayner and their experiment, which posited that fear be studied as conditioned emotional reactions, um, by far the most predominant paradigm for which to study fear uh, and learning mechanisms have been uh, classical or Pavlovian fear conditioning rodents. And I'm sure many, if not all of you, are very familiar with what this paradigm is, but um, I'll just briefly go over the, the basic idea. So you place a uh, rat or a mouse in a small enclosed uh, chamber uh, with a shock grid floor and some type of uh, device to emit uh, some type of external stimuli. So uh, for example, in a tone fear conditioning experiment, you would place the rat or mouse in this uh, conditioning box you would play uh, initially innocuous uh, cues such as a tone, and this would be followed by uh, something that's naturally aversive, and that would be a shock to the animal's feet typically. And in this case, you'd observe uh, the initial reaction of the animal to the shock, the startle, uh, and then followed by a freezing response, which would be the unconditioned response. And then you typically pair this uh, tone and a shock a few times, and then uh, to test if the animal has formed a fear memory, Sometime later, you would place the animal back in the conditioning box and play just the tone. And if the animal has learned, then they would emit a conditioned freezing uh, to the uh, tone CS or, or tone conditioned stimulus. Um, so using this largely reductionist model uh, systems approach, uh, researchers have, researchers have uh, made great progress in understanding the molecular and neural circuit dynamics uh, of learned fear and Obviously, it's important since psychology and neuroscience uh, is well deserved. Um, so, although Pavlovian fear conditioning has been the predominant paradigm for over a century for which to study fear, um, there have been a variety of other uh, paradigms and rodents, obviously, that have been developed uh, that utilize threat uh, to examine other more complex uh, behavioral processes uh, of fear and anxiety related behavior. Uh, including how fear and anxiety influence uh, decision making, right? So, getting at this executive function type of thing. Uh, so, one such paradigm is a bit more complex. Uh, it's the approach avoidance conflict paradigm. And essentially, uh, these tasks examine conflict between approach toward an incentive uh, uh, and simultaneously either conditioned uh, or innate defensive behavior. Uh, so in a sense, this task is more naturalistic uh, to the animal. So it allows for um, decision making under risk, as opposed to the Pavlovian conditioning, where the animal is kind of arbitrarily placed in a chamber, doesn't have any uh, task or goal um, to the paradigm. So one example 
uh, of a conditions uh, defensive behavior approach avoidance conflict task is the Geller Seifter test uh, shown here in the bottom left corner. So briefly in this task, uh, animal is placed in a operant chamber where it has a lever that can press to obtain food pellets. And sometime during the experiment, a uh, cue comes on and if the animal um, presses the lever in the presence of this cue, it receives a shock to its foot. Uh, and so over time, the animal learns that every time the tone is on, if they press, they're going to, to be shocked. So the conflict becomes uh, between um, pressing the lever for food because they're hungry, uh, while, while also this uh, avoidance of, of uh, experiencing this aversive event, uh, the foot shock. Uh, but the, again, the condition component um, is, is the animal has to, just like in Pavlovian fear conditioning, learn the association between the tone and the shock, and actually as well, the, their action, um, the pressing of the lever and the shock. Another very common um, uh, approach avoidance conflict uh, is the elevated plus maze. And again, many of you are probably familiar with this and it's largely used to assess uh, anxiety in, uh, in animals and rodents. But uh, here the conflict, so you can think of it as the animal has a natural drive to explore its environment, um, but it's also um, has a natural tendency to want to avoid open spaces. And so here the task is simply you place an animal on this elevated uh, maze, uh, this T maze, and the, or sorry, not T maze, the uh, plus maze, and two of the arms are enclosed with walls and two of the arms are open. And you simply examine um, the ratio of the animal spins in these opened uh, arms versus the enclosed arms. So if an animal uh, is more anxious, it'll spend more time in this enclosed arm. So again, the conflict here is the, is between wanting to explore its environment but avoid this open, uh, potentially dangerous um, open arms. Uh, so with these two paradigms in mind, uh, while they de definitely have their uses, especially kind of in, a, in acute uh, situations, um, they all share similar limitations. So for one, they're typically uh, animals are typically in small enclosed chambers that severely restrict their behavioral repertoire. Uh, they do not readily assess innate fear toward non-pain inducing discrete stimuli, such as predator cues, um, and they take a hyper-focused approach, measuring only uh, a handful of, of behavioral variables, such as time spent freezing or time spent open arm versus enclosed arm, for example. And typically they're short, uh, short in duration, that, and this provides kind of what you can think of uh, are snapshots of a given uh, phenomenon, whether that be their behavior or if you're looking at neural activity, snapshots of, of neural activity. So, in, in very brief moments. So, I'd like you to contrast uh, these traditional uh, behavioral paradigms with um, some scenarios that might actually happen in nature. So, uh, so in both these scenarios, let's say we have a, uh, a foraging mouse. Uh, who has a burrow and they have a food patch uh, nearby. So let's say in one scenario, which I'll call the pre-encounter scenario, there is a threat potential. So for example, um, perhaps the animal hasn't encountered a predator yet, predator yet in its environment, um, but it might be out there. Or let's say they've encountered the predator previously, but it's not currently present. So they have a lot of options. They can choose to inhibit their foraging altogether if it's a high risk or high anxiety type scenario, or they can choose to reorganize uh, their foraging behavior for, or over a long period of time, which as I'll get to um, is, is something that the risk equals economy is specialized for. So they might actually decrease the amount of eating bouts they um, Per day, so the amount of meals they consume, the amount of times they go out to uh, seek food, uh, and when they do seek food, when they actually are foraging, they might increase the amount of food they consume per eating bout or meal um, while they're out there, uh, and decrease the amount of actual meals they have. So this, in a sense, reduces their um, their vulnerability. So. Um, they might actually choose to procure their food and consume it at the food patch if it's a, a low risk scenario or if it's a high risk scenario they might actually choose choose to procure the food and return to the nest to consume it in the safety of their burrow uh, 
uh, they might actually switch when they choose to forage, for example. So um, let's say uh, they prefer to forage in the daytime, uh, but they typically encounter their predator during the daytime. So they might actually switch their foraging um, to a time that they wouldn't normally forage, for example, at night. Now, in another scenario, let's say they actually encounter a threat. So in this case, maybe a, a weasel, right? So in this case, it's a high, high threat scenario, um, more akin to a fear-like response. They might actually choose to flee if escape is, is possible. Uh, let's say they're they're close to their burrow, for example. Um, if they cannot uh, flee safely, they might choose to freeze, so inhibit their movement. Um, or they might actually continue foraging if the predator uh, is, let's say, visible, but uh, at a distance that's not yet completely uh, imminent. Or if the, the predator is very close, contact is imminent, they might actually bite the predator, so might actually cho choose to bite. So from the perspective of ethology, fear and anxiety are complex forms of motivation that have biologi biological utility. utility. They serve to keep the organism alive in nature. So what is ethology? Uh, ethology is a scientific study of an organism's behavior in its natural environment. And so then an ethological paradigm seeks to engender naturalistic scenarios and tasks within a laboratory setting. And these ethological paradigms carry uh, certain advantages. So for one, uh, they are typically goal-oriented, uh, where you can examine the purpose of behavior. So for example, the animal has a task, uh, that being uh, forage for food. And this, and this type of uh, task is, is kind of a naturalistic thing for the animal. Um, you can examine uh, typically short and long-term impacts of fear and anxiety on decision-making. And uh, because the tasks are typically goal-oriented goal and, and allow for uh, more behavior, um, or sorry, more complex, then you get a typically expansion of behavioral repertoire, what the animal can actually do. They have more options. And uh, depending on the paradigm, you could examine the influence of a variety of innately uh, aversive stimuli on fear and anxiety. Um, So uh, it was our position uh, in the lab that by studying the brain's fear and anxiety system under situations that likely evolved to handle, a more accurate understanding of that system may be obtained. Um, and this is just showing uh, <laughs> another paradigm that we've used in the lab. And, and perhaps if we have time after I discuss the risky closed economy, I'll, I'll briefly show you a video. It's not necessarily a home cage based uh, paradigm, but I think it's interesting and, and related to the closed economy. Okay, so now that I've discussed the some traditional paradigms, I'd like to shift focus now to um, the main thing, which is the risky close economy, this holistic longitudinal approach to studying fear, anxiety, and rodents. Um, as well as introducing the paradigm, I'd like to discuss or, or present some data that I've collected in the lab um, to kind of uh, give you all a sense of its utility and what it could be used to uh, to model and measure. So first, uh, again, I want to introduce another natural scenario in nature. So fearful events not only produce immediate changes in behavior, but can reshape day-to-day -day behavior as well. So uh, let's take our, our furry rodent friend again. Uh, he or she has a burrow. And again, there's a, uh, a nearby food patch. Actually, there's several. So its preferred food patch was initially this pumpkin patch over here across this lake. But let's say uh, one day during foraging, it encounters a, a particularly um, uh, threat-inducing predator that has some kind of fearful event. And because of the singular event, or let's say maybe multiple events, it now chooses to forage at this less profitable uh, but safer food patch near its burrow. So this single event shapes this animal's long-term foraging behavior. An example of humans might be, let's say I like to take uh, the freeway to work in, in the red here, uh, but I encountered or I was in a, um, a car accident that was very uh, frightful. And now because of that one incident, I now take a, a longer, more circuitous path to work that's maybe um, not as preferred, but safer. So the question becomes, so how do we model 
such a such a scenario as which the rat or mouse above faces. So as a starting point, we look to uh, toward the field of behavioral economics um, and specifically this concept of a closed economy. So uh, what is a closed economy? Uh, a closed economy is a scenario in which the animal's consumption of food or demand results solely from its interaction with the schedules of reinforcement or supply. So in other words, uh, the animal is, is in total control of its food and water intake, um, or sorry, food intake via lever pressing without uh, experimental food supplementation. Uh, so in contrast, uh, in contrast would be an open economy, right? So this is a scenario in which food is supplemented. And so let's focus now on the open economy, which is the kind of more typical um, case for, for a lot of behavioral research. And let's, let's focus specifically, let's say an operant task. So what does this look like in an open economy? So it's what you typically think of. So let's say an animal has to press a lever to obtain food. You place them in an operant chamber. And for some brief period, the animal uh, has the ability to lever press to obtain food. And animals in this case are typically food restrictive because you have to motivate them to, to want to press. And then sometime um, later, uh, for the majority of the day, they're back in their, uh, their home cage, let's say in a vivarium where uh, the experimenter then supplements and gives them uh, the rest of their food for the day. Uh, in a closed economy scenario, again, the animal is in total control of how much food uh, and indeed water it consumes. So uh, let's say it's the animals and again in an operant task. In this case, the animal spends most of its time in the operant chamber itself. So these are extended tests that can last for hours of days. Um, and only later for maybe brief amounts of time per day, maybe an hour, maybe less, they're placed in a temporary housing condition. Let's say if the experimenter has to perform maintenance on the uh, operant chamber itself. And in this case, when they're in a temporary housing, there's food is not available and food, the animals are not food restricted in this scenario. And so early experiments uh, in close economy um, type scenarios have shown that um, in close economies, animals will uh, lever press at higher lever costs than those uh, in open economies where food is supplemented. So they'll work much harder to obtain their food when that's in the operant tax, so that's the only place where they can obtain that food. Um, and so one thing that we typically see in closed economies uh, is, this, is this foraging dynamic where as you increase the procurement cost for the food, for example, uh, let's say a higher uh, ratio uh, for, of obtaining food, so they have to press more times to obtain a pellet, uh, you typically see with increased food procurement costs, um, this increase in what's called uh, the meal size. So when the animal does engage with the lever, and they start to obtain pellets uh, during the eating bout to obtain a lot of food, and they simultaneously decrease the amount of uh, meal frequency or the amount of eating bouts they have to offset the amount of uh, physical effort that they have. So when they do obtain food, they're uh, eating a lot at one time. And so um, typically this kind of uh, dynamic is induced by a specific lever contingency called the fixed ratio to continuous reinforcement schedule or chain schedule. And so what this means is uh, under this ratio, under the schedule, let's say we'll take example of a fixed ratio 25 to continuous reinforcement. The animal has to press 24, press the lever 24 times without obtaining food. And on the 25th press, they're rewarded uh, with one pellet. And at the 25th press, they break a threshold uh, in the reinforcement schedule and they now enter into a continuous reinforcement uh, part of the chain where every press after the um, 25th press results in one pellet per press. And so this break in the uh, FR25 component initiates what's called the meal. Um, so, uh, and then every pellet obtained uh, during the continuous reinforcement phase that constitutes the meal size. And so this is how we can break up the animals um, daily eating patterns into, into discrete meals. So, so what is food, food procurement cost in the wild? Uh, so in nature, food procurement costs will correspond to, for example, the time or effort to physically attain food. 
And there's an additional cost as well, which, which I'll call the consumption cost. And this relates to um, the time and effort to actually physically manipulate the food once it's obtained and consume the food, food so the consumatory phase. Um, right, so this fixed ratio uh, to continuous reinforcement chain that's typically utilized in closed economy uh, experiments uh, is a way to simulate uh, in the wild this food procurement uh, and consumption costs. So the continuous reinforcement phase of the um, the chain schedule that would kind of correspond to the consumption costs that I just that I just talked about. Okay. So so here in our lab, uh, we expanded on, on the concept of uh, the closed economy uh, by introducing another food consumption cost in the wild, and that is the uh, the cost of predation. And so the incorporation of predation risk into the closed economy framework um, is what defines this risky closed economy that we that we developed. Um, and so how do we model uh, predation uh, in the closed economy? Well, in this case, as you can see, uh, here's the closed economy uh, apparatus. Uh, it's simulated by administering foot shocks in either uh, uh, signaled or, or signaled foot shock or unsignaled foot shock, which I'll I'll explain next. But um, here is a yeah. So here is the close economy, uh, risky close economy, and it's uh, a chamber, operant chamber that's uh, modified, and it, it is partitioned into two major zones. So we have this uh, nest area, which is just composed of a corn cob bedding, and the foraging zone, which has the shock grid floor. And it's in the foraging zone uh, that the animal has uh, operant lever, a food hopper, and a water spout, uh, as well as, uh, in this example, a, a light cue. And uh, during this, uh, and during the entire um, experiment, for example, we have uh, a tracking camera mounted above the chamber uh, that that monitors the animal's behavior, um, and the chamber itself. Uh, is connected to a central computer that can measure um, the uh, lever pressing activity, the water looking activity of the animal, um, and also is is designed to administer the uh, foot shock to the animal at a specific phase of the experiment. Um, so, in one condition of the risky close economy, which we'll call the unsignaled shock condition, uh, the foot shocks are not signaled to the animal when they are going to occur. So uh, in this case, these foot shocks are administered pseudo randomly, uh, and the animal has to adapt uh, to this uh, this unpredictable uh, foot shock. So this might be uh, is, this is an anxiety centered paradigm because again, the animal the fear is is a, a diffuse type of um, fear where it's 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 not exactly clear when it's going to occur. And so I should mention too that the animals, most importantly, the animals live in these chambers. So they're in here for 23 to 47 hours a day uh, being monitored and tracked and all their um, variables counted. Um, and so the shock when it does occur pseudo randomly, um, it's occurring throughout the day so it's about two shocks per hour uh, on average and a maximum of 48 shocks per day. And again, it's in, this, in this scenario, it's unsignaled. And so in this case, when it's unsignaled, the animal can't predict when the shock is going to occur. Uh, in rats, at least, we typically see um, a very characteristic uh, behavior where the animals during the, uh, when the unsignaled shock is occurring, the greatly decrease the amount of time they're spending in this foraging zone. Uh, and you see this kind of shift in, in forging dynamics that I described uh, in, in the typical closed economy experiment, where um, as a result of uh, the food procurement costs, in this case, the uh, being being shocked, uh, you see a, a great decrease in the, um, the amount of eating bouts or meal frequency and simul, uh, simultaneous increase in <laughs> meal size. I, I think somebody's uh, not muted. Um, Additionally, uh, you see a great decrease in the amount of water the animal consumes, and the animal greatly decreases the uh, their activity, overall locomotor activity. 
Now, um, this is a modular system, so you can slide in and out of these slots, different components. And in this case, you could, for example, insert a light cube. Um, and, and so you could now signal uh, the imminence of a shock if you are looking to, to do so. Um, and in this case, this would be a more fear-centered type of paradigm or task where the when the cue, if the, when the animal learns the association between the shock and the cue, and the cue comes on as more of a, an immediate threat, the animal knows the threat is imminent, right? So in this case, uh, what we see is that the animals show this characteristic decrease in, in time spent in the foraging zone and increase in meal size, uh, decrease in meal frequency, and decrease in water licks and distance traveled, but it's much uh, to a much, much less degree than what you'd see in the unsignaled shock condition. Um, so that being said, uh, in the unsignaled uh, shock condition, you see a greater frequency of uh, escape responses. So when the um, shock comes on, when they are in the foraging zone, um, the animals experience a shock and then they immediately, presumably run over to the nest area to escape it. Um, you see less avoidance response. So that, uh, and then you see greater uh, instances of freezing and latency to enter the foraging zone in this unsignaled condition. And so I'm going to focus on um, experiments conducted in the unsignaled type of scenarios, anxiety-centered scenario of close economy. Yeah, so I should mention too that when the shock does come on, it stays on for uh, uh, in, in one in the experiment I'll describe next for uh, for 10 seconds unless the animal escapes from the nest area. So each risky close economy experiment typically starts with a um, typically has a very similar uh, procedural outline. So we start with introducing the animal to the apparatus where they live, uh, and we uh, shape them to, to be able to uh, perform this uh, fixed ratio to continuous reinforcement schedule. So in this case, I use a fixed ratio 25 to continuous reinforcement schedule. And once you've learned this, then we undergo a simple baseline foraging and activity behavior um, phase where there's no aversive uh, foot shock quite yet just examining their baseline foraging behavior. And then once we have that, then we introduce what we call the shock phase. So we introduce the pseudo random unsignaled foot shock in the foraging zone and see how the animals adapt uh, to this to the situation. And then uh, for the last phase, we, we have an extinction phase where we remove the uh, presence of the shock unbeknownst to the animal and we see how the animal adapts um, to this, this um, kind of return to, to normalcy. So do they continue um, any altered behavior during shock, or they, do they return to their baseline behavior? So uh, I was the first to uh, build this risky close economy uh, in mice and, and test this concept. And so I'll show you now the results from uh, this experiment in mice. So for each of these graphs on the x-axis, you have uh, the different days of the experiment. Uh, and so the bottom uh, of each of these graphs shows the average for uh, each week. Um, and then the, for the top of each graph, this shows the, um, the average for each animal, uh, the average for the group of animals in the black bar, and then the gray traces behind it as each individual animal. Um, and then the red uh, background here corresponds to the shock based experiment where we're now introducing shock. So regarding the amount of time spent in the foraging zone, uh, you can see that during uh, the shock phase, uh, these male C57 mice, uh, adult males, uh, greatly decrease the amount of time that they spend uh, in the foraging zone. And this actually maintains when the shock is removed during the extinction phase. And this is largely due to negative reinforcement. Um, so regarding the amount of eating bouts per day or meal frequency, what I saw in these male mice was that during the first week of shock, uh, relative to baseline, they decrease uh, the amount of meals they have, but this recovers by week two of shock uh, onward. Uh, similarly, the amount of actual pellets that they consume, the amount of food they consume, that decreases during the first week as a result of this aversive unsignaled shock, but recovers by week two, while the amount of water lips is greatly decreased uh, during the shock phase and only recovers uh, during the second week of extinction. And curiously, I didn't see uh, in this experiment um, a change in their meal size uh, relative to baseline. Uh, 
but during the shock phase, the animals lost weight. So ultimately, uh, these adult male mice, uh, based on our previous experiments, uh, close economy experiments in rats, um, they actually did not show a characteristic meal pattern, um, likely because the parameters were either too aversive um, or what I think as well as the size of the food. So this was the very first experiment in mice. I think the size of the food also affected the uh, lack of um, kind of behavioral alteration and, and meal pattern, characteristic meal pattern changes we see. Um, so they ultimately behaved like female mice where they actually lost weight during the uh, aversive shock period. They didn't adapt like male uh, rats would uh, and offset this uh, shock by eating uh, more during each meal uh, and having less meals uh, to maintain their weight. Um, so another thing that um, the close economy is good for, uh, because the animals live in these chambers, um, you can examine uh, circadian behavior. So in one experiment that I conducted and I'm still analyzing, I looked at uh, the 5X FAD Alzheimer, Alzheimer's mouse model, just simply their repetitive behavior. So actually I didn't introduce shock at all in this case. I just simply ran a, a traditional closed economy experiment in this apparatus uh, looking at their foraging behavior. So if we look at um, uh, their foraging behavior throughout the day, so this is showing the hour of the day uh, and this the red outline is the dark phase of the experiment. So when, when the lights are, are off, um, what we see as that in these um, Alzheimer's mice, these 5XFAD uh, hemizygous animals as shown in the uh, kind of the uh, half circles here, we see that during the last uh, three hours of their dark cycle, their night, their night cycle, we see increased uh, amount of food consumed uh, relative to their wild type counterparts. Uh, while there was no difference in uh, their their overall locomotor activity or circadian activity, and they largely showed a, a pretty normal circadian period. So, just as an example, you could um, examine circadian behavior uh, in this type of home cage, uh, risky close economy home cage as well. And again, this is just showing um, more circadian behavior uh, possibilities. So, you can also examine free running, for example, uh, using the close economy risky close economy. So uh, in conclusion, the risky close economy is a longitudinal type task. So they're in there for again, 23 hours uh, to 20 to 47 hours per day, continuous data collection. Uh, I should mention that we only remove the animal uh, for one hour uh, a day or one hour, one hour every two days um, to perform maintenance on the chambers themselves. And during the time they're in their temporary housing, uh, they do not, do not have access to any food or water. So again, all their food and water comes from the closed economy. You can measure a multitude of behavioral variables. So this holistic approach um, to behavioral testing and it's naturalistic. So it's a risky foraging scenario that requires effort and decision-making where the need to acquire food and water while avoiding unpredictable threat is actually integrated into the animal's lives. So it's this ethologically relevant goal-oriented or purpose of task that facilitates interpretation of behavior. And importantly, uh, there's also minimal experimental experimental interaction. And so what I've shown so far is that my survival subjects in the risky close economy, although as I mentioned, um, parameters uh, likely need to be refined. But there are certain limitations associated with close economy, risky close economy, and um, the most obvious is obviously uh, this being a longitudinal task, the experiments take a considerable amount of time to complete. So um, what I showed was a, a very short form uh, ta uh, version of the task, but the task can go on for months, depending on the experiment uh, design. Uh, also in this in this type of paradigm, there's a overhead cover. So this overhead cover can obstruct tethered tools. So this would make it necessary to um, obtain some type of uh, wireless technology if you're looking to do any um, uh, neural manipulation or, for example, um, electrophysiology. And as I've shown, um, animals in this case are single housed in these close economy chambers. So there is social isolation uh, as a factor. Um, I should mention too that with the overhead cover, um, one alternative uh, is to have 
uh, no cover and maybe some type of camera mounted above, maybe on the ceiling, for example, and have um, just very high walls of the chamber itself so you can implement uh, tethered tools. And as far as social isolation, perhaps you can um, make the walls of the uh, risky closed economy uh, apparatus clear with, with holes, for example, and place the animals closer together so they can kind of at least see and smell each other. Um, but obviously these are, are some, some limitations to take into consideration if you're looking to do some type of risky closed economy experiment. And overall, the apparatus themselves, I'm going to go back to it really quick, are fairly easy to construct. So this is custom built, obviously, and um, I designed everything in uh, a free CAD software, and I used just commercially available plastic. Uh, and I built all of these chambers uh, on, on, my, on my campus, where there was a campus workshop that was available to students, which I think is, is becoming more and more popular. Uh, and available on campuses. Um, the, and they're fairly uh, fairly cheap to build relative to buying a commercially available apparatus. Uh, for example, something like from um, yeah, one of the major apparatus corporations. Uh, the most expensive part was the stuff that I did have to buy from from such corporations like the, uh, for example, the feeder uh, and and levers, for example overall very cost effective. So I next want to describe one additional experiment to highlight uh, something about the closed risky closed economy that I haven't talked about yet. And for this experiment, I examined from a holistic perspective the effects of the lateral habanula lesions in rats. So while this was a mouse risky closed economy experiment, I'm not going to switch to a rat version. And so just some introduction. So what is a banula? It's a structure located deep in the middle of the brain. Evolution, evolutionarily speaking, it's a, it's a very old structure. It's present in humans, rodents, and even a deep fish. Okay, I'm sorry, there we go. Um, and this is just some uh, histology showing the location of the habanula in the rodent, in the rat in this case, coronal section. And it's partitioned into two subnuclei, the medial habanula and the lateral habanula. And I chose, I chose to focus on the lateral portion of the habanula for this experiment. And so why study the lateral habanula? Well, it's been highly implicated in avoidance learning. So if you stimulate the uh, lateral habanula uh, in a partition chamber, on the side of the chamber where the stimulation occurs, the animals will greatly avoid that stimulation. And in an approach avoidance conflict, uh, so for example, in a, in a geller seifter uh, style task, uh, if you inhibit the uh, habanula, uh, the animals will, uh, in operant chamber task, if the, uh, th they will continue lever pressing uh, in the presence of a tone uh, that signals the onset of a shock relative to uh, animals that do not have uh, inactivated auto habanula. It's also been implicated in purely appetitive or reward-seeking behavior as well. Uh, so for example, if you uh, inhibit the lateral habanula uh, using chemogenetics, they will um, engage in more active uh, infusions uh, of cocaine relative to controls that receive vehicle. But curiously, for um, natural reinforcers such as food pellets, uh, inhibiting the lateral habanula actually doesn't increase just uh, uh, consumption of food in general. Um, and also clinically, this is a very, um, uh, seems to be a very important region uh, to study for uh, pathologies such as depression, addiction and schizophrenia, which has been implicated in that. So, so I thought the risky closed economy would be a great uh, paradigm for which to study the effects of lateral habanula, um, the effects of lateral habanula lesions uh, so overall, little is known about the lateral habanula's role in appetitive behavior, especially as it relates to long-term foraging for natural reinforcers or just natural foraging in general. So I sought to clarify the involvement of the lateral habanula or LHB in this naturalistic competitive and naturalistic competitive behavior under risk-free and risky conditions using the risky closed economy 
specifically examine the effects of uh, electrolytic lesions on avoidance and approach avoidance conflict decision making during the shock phase of the risk of close economy. And I hypothesize that there'd be no influence uh, on risk free based on foraging behavior um, based on previous literature, um, while they're, they would also exhibit a reduced avoidance and, and um, not engage in this defensive meal pattern reorganization following unsignaled chronic foot shocks. And so this is the rat uh, version of the risk close economy is largely the same, except that it's much bigger, obviously, to accommodate the size difference in mice. And the procedure um, was also very similar. Similar, So I trained the animals to uh, procure food in a fixed ratio 25 continuous uh, reinforcement schedule. And then they underwent what I call the pre-surgery baseline, uh, where uh, the animals simply engaged in uh, baseline foraging activity behavior uh, prior to surgery, prior to any uh, aversive um, shocks. Then they underwent surgery where I, uh, I either uh, gave electrolytic lesions to the lateral banula or sham lesions uh, to half of the, the other half of the animals. I placed them right back in the closed economy to recover. Uh, and then they recovered uh, and followed by a post-surgery baseline where I examined again their baseline foraging and activity behavior, but I examined now whether any change in, the, in this baseline foraging uh, behavior as a result of the surgery. And once we had that information, then I introduced the uh, pseudo-random unsignaled foot shocks in the foraging zone to see how they adapt. And then finally, I removed the uh, shocks and examined extinction-like behavior. And so uh, this is showing now the foraging data. So on the x-axis, again, we show we have the different phases of the experiment, the average, so pre-surgery average, post-surgery, and then the shock week one, two, extinction week one, extinction week two. The yellow uh, box outlined indicates the shock period. And then again, on each y-axis, this is a different meal variable. So the animals that have the lateral banula lesion uh, shown in the red trace here. Um, the first thing that was was noticeable was that uh, prior to surgery, or sorry, uh, post surgery, uh, prior to any shock, we saw uh, increase in the amount of eating bouts per day in these animals relative to the sham uh, animals that had intact lateral banula. Uh, simultaneously, I saw a decrease in the meal size, or the amount of pellets obtained per meal. Uh, in these lesioned animals. And these animals also slightly ate more food overall relative to the in intact animals. So right away, before any aversive uh, um, introduction of shock, these animals that have the LHB lesion show this altered day-to-day -day foraging behavior. And because of this baseline difference then, um, in order to better interpret the effects of shock on these animals, given their baseline changes, um, I normalized or expressed the data in terms of uh, each variable in terms of percent of their post-surgery uh, uh, values. Uh, and so what we see is that during shock, the lateral banula lesion animals, just like the sham animals, decrease uh, their meal frequency uh, and increase their meal size. Um, but Above and beyond the control animals, uh, we still see that they're eating, uh, engaging in higher meal frequency and, and having this lower meal size, and they still are obtaining more pellets. But again, if we normalize the data, express it as percent of their post surgery data, they're largely behaving the same, they're reacting the same to shock. So, in terms of their um, anxiety and avoidance behavior, it's largely the same. It's just you have this altered meal pattern now that is just permanently altered throughout the duration of the experiment. And this is now showing their uh, movement-related variables. So um, the amount of time they spend in the foraging zone uh, relative to uh, their intact counterparts during the shock is largely the same. So they're avoiding just the same. Uh, and they're receiving the same amount of foot shocks. And there's no difference in terms of their overall locomotor activity as a result of the lesion. So to give a summary of what I found, uh, so relative to the intact counterparts, we have a baseline change in their meal frequency or eating bouts per day. Uh, 
simultaneous decrease in their meal size and increase in the amount of pellets consumed overall without showing any change in locomotor activity. Um, and in terms of avoidance and anxiety, uh, time spent in the foraging zone was largely the same during the shock period. It received the same amount of shocks in the foraging zone and the overall effect of uh, shock was, was on their behavior was largely the same. And so using this risky close economy um, where their behavior is, is nearly uninterrupted and there's this and they're under these extended closed economy conditions, I was able to kind of clarify uh, the lateral abandonment's involvement uh, in appetitive behavior, uh, which was not apparent in kind of other experiments that have this more acute style task. And so using this risky closed economy with this holistic approach, I was able to screen numerous pre and post lesions behavior, uh, post lesion behavior prior to introducing a new task condition, which uh, overall help clarify uh, the overall finding. Uh, so for example, without that post-surgery baseline period, um, uh, animal it would have appeared that animals were um, uh, not reorganized. It would look like they were less anxious because they're um, not reorganizing uh, their, their food behavior. Uh, however, because of the post-surgery assessment, I saw that indeed they're just their baseline eating patterns were altered without the presence of threat, uh, and that they indeed showed the characteristic meal pattern reorganization resulting from the shock. And so what might be a mechanism here? Um, well, if we look at um, one, one pathway of the lateral vanula, so during times of satiety, uh, the arcuate nucleus in the hypothalamus uh, signals to the uh, lateral hypothalamic area uh, that the animal is is full, for example, eating food, which then gets past the lateral vanula, which then feeds forwards onto this other area called the rostromedial tegmental area, which ultimately inhibits the ventral tegmental area to decrease dopamine activity, incentive salience placed on food cues, and therefore decrease approach behavior during satiety. If you take that region out, the lateral vanula, then that message isn't passed to the uh, ventral tegmental area resulting in aberrant uh, dopamine activity and presumably increased incentive salience placed on food cues during times of satiety, satiety and therefore uh, increased approach behavior uh, towards those food cues such as the, the lever itself and then the engage and in, in lever pressing um, uh, during times of satiety. So um, as a take home message, the um, fear and anxiety are complex motivational states that influence many behaviors, including decision making. Um, and by modeling scenarios in the wild through use of ecological paradigms, their complexity uh, can better be captured uh, in comparison to traditional reductionist paradigms. Um, but again, uh, I want to emphasize that there's uh, the traditional paradigms are not, um, it's not, they're not useful at all. They're, they're very useful for certain acute type behaviors, but in addition to those traditional paradigms, something like the closed economy um, should be implemented to kind of capture this uh, long-term changes in, in behavior. So uh, moreover, by studying the brain's fear system and anxiety system or situations that it likely evolved to handle, uh, perhaps a more accurate understanding of that system may be obtained. Um, so I just wanna thank uh, my previous lab members and undergraduate students and um, my committee members uh, for my dissertation, this dissertation work. Um, but that's all I have for you today. Uh, and thank you so much for, for listening.